July 4th, Dogman Stories. Number 1. Werewolves in the Bronx? Dear Scary Stories, NYC. I listen to your show a lot. I'm from NYC like you. But when you say you never saw a cryptid because you live in New York and they don't live there, I have to disagree with you. There are definitely cryptids in New York City. I mean, you're not going to find the Loch Ness Monster here. But you can find shapeshifters. Or more likely, they can find you. I'll tell you a story that happened to me back in the bicentennial year of 1976, on the night of July 4th. So, do you know the projects that start over at the corner of Burke and Bauk? Google Maps tells me that they're called East Chester Gardens, but I only ever remember anyone calling them the projects. It's also telling me that this neighborhood is called Laconia, but I grew up here, and I never heard that word before in my entire life. Anyway, that was where my dogman story took place. Or a werewolf story, I guess I should say. I was 17 that year. Or actually, I turned 17 in August. So I would have been 16 on July 4th, 1976. I had managed to buy myself some fireworks, which are illegal in the Bronx. And I was very excited to set them off. I needed a place where I wouldn't get in trouble for it, though where my parents wouldn't find out that I had done this. A friend of mine tipped me off to a little house, tinier than any other house in the neighborhood, where a little old lady with dementia lived. Back then, we called her a senile. I never met her, but I was told that you could play in her backyard or set off fireworks there, because she was too old and feeble to do anything about it, except yell at you from her chair inside. While I didn't like the idea of bothering an old lady, I did like the idea of a safe backyard to set my fireworks off in. Looking at Google Maps, I'm amazed to see the house that I'm talking about. There it is. You can see how it must have been built much earlier than the ones around it. It's clearly from another time, and it looked like that even back then, especially right across the street from the projects as it is. That image is from February 2022. Oh, but when I pull back from street view to satellite view, we can see that the house is completely gone now. Wow, I'm glad I'm writing this memory down for you now while the street view images are still online, so that you can see basically what I saw that night. The realization of the passage of time can hit you emotionally sometimes, and even though that little old lady passed on a long time ago, seeing her house gone as well kind of hits me hard in the heart for some reason. But in those days, I would have been even happier if her house had been an empty lot, since I was looking for a place to blow up some M80s. We were told that those things were a quarter stick of dynamite. I have no idea why boys and young men are so attracted to things that can accidentally explode your hand off, but that's the way it is. I knew a kid in school with half his pinky amputated because of a fireworks accident, but I still saved up my money to get four M80s to blow up on July 4th. That was just who I was at that age. So anyway, I snuck away from my family and I made my way over to Bauk Avenue where the little old lady lived in her tiny yellow house across the street from the big apartment buildings. I hopped the fence and walked to her backyard and I could hear her screaming from her chair just as I had been warned that she would do. She never left the chair which was also just as I had been told. When I reached her backyard, I started getting set up to blow off my explosives in the direct center of the yard. Suddenly, out of nowhere, I got surrounded by these two guys, one in front and one behind. They were speaking to me with Puerto Rican Bronx accents, and they were asking me what I was doing in this lady's backyard, but in English, not in Spanish. I stood up quickly, and I wanted to see who they were before I answered anything. I stupidly hadn't prepared anything smart to say in this sort of situation, so I also needed to stall for time. When I saw the face of the guy in front of me, though, it didn't make any sense. I was looking at the head of a wolf or something, but this was a guy, bigger than me, wearing a black leather jacket, but his head wasn't human. I turned around quickly, 
I was even more surprised to see that the guy behind me also had a wolfen kind of head. He bared his teeth at me, revealing these long fangs like you'd see in a tiger. I couldn't tell if he was wearing a mask. I wanted to run from him, but I couldn't run from either one of them. The guy behind me reminded me that I had been asked a question. I still didn't have any answer though, so I just started pleading with them not to hurt me. I told them how much money I had on me, then I said they could have it. They both started laughing and saying they didn't want my money. That was a relief. This wasn't a mugging. So what did they want? While I was looking at the guy behind me, the one in front said, We want your blood. When I turned to look at him in shock, the guy behind me said, That's right. We're going to drink your blood and make you into an hombre loco like us. They were both snickering, so I couldn't tell if they were serious or if they were just trying to scare me. They never spoke when I was looking directly at them, I remember. I don't know how they could have spoken anyway, because they did not have human mouths, but canine ones. I fell to my knees and begged them not to do it. I forget what I said, but I'm sure it was pretty pathetic whatever it was. I just wanted to live. I promised them anything. I told them they could have my M80s. One of them stepped on the back of my neck and pushed my face down into the grass. You're going to swear to us that you ain't going to bother this old lady here anymore to start with, a voice up over my head said, as a boot heel pushed down and made me taste dirt. I tried to swear, but it was hard to talk in that position. I mean, I'm not complaining. I made it almost to age 17 before I found out the taste of dirt and grass. So really, I was lucky. I wasn't feeling lucky in that moment, though. They tossed a paper notepad and a big pen onto the ground next to me, then started barking out orders of what they wanted me to write down. My name. My address. Both my parents' names. My school. What grade I was going into in the fall. I forget what else. These days, they could have found out more on Facebook, but back then I felt savaged and ravaged like they had robbed me of all my private information. They knew where to find me, and they knew who my parents were. They stood in the dark, talking in Spanglish about telling my parents what they had caught me doing, and I got pretty scared. Ultimately, they kept my M80s and sent me packing, with nothing more than a sore neck and the taste of worms in my mouth. I consider myself lucky. I got captured by werewolves but I got off with only a warning. Seriously, that was the night I learned to respect other kinds of religions. I know those two guys were into some kind of magic, and that's how they were shapeshifters. They had to be some kind of wizards or something, which meant they were part of a tradition of some sort of magical system. I'm being vague because that's all I know on that subject. I don't know if I'm speaking about Santa Rhea or what, so... I'm just going to try to remain vague. Was it possibly a Native American kind of magic they were using? I guess so, maybe. Those two definitely knew how to do things back then that I have never learned myself in all those years since. Someone must have taught them that. And I would guess that someone was either across the street in those projects or else was a relative of someone that was. And here they were, looking out for this old white lady, just because she couldn't look out for herself. They were practicing vigilante policing, but I was being a punk-ass jerk to that old lady, and I deserved worse than what I got. So yeah, there are cryptids and monsters in the city, too. I should know, because I personally ran into... Werewolves. In the Bronx. My Grandfather's 4th of July Dogman Encounter Dear Scary Stories NYC My grandfather, God rest his soul, was the first person I ever knew who told me that werewolves were real. I think he was talking about the Dogman. He told me that werewolves live in the woods of Pennsylvania, 
and he wasn't telling me this information in a way meant to scare me. He told it to me in the same way that he would explain to me why America is the single greatest achievement of humanity, and that it will forever have to fight against those who hate freedom and want to rule over us. To him, the fact that a werewolf can exist out in the woods was just a fact, but it was a fact based on a personal experience that he had long before I was born. Grandpa was a young man when this happened, sometime in the middle of the 60s, most likely 1965. He was with some other friends his age, and they were at Keystone State Park for July 4th. One of them had brought a rowboat to the lake, and the four of them decided to row down the long lake toward the area where a fireworks display was going to happen. They were hoping to get to watch the fireworks reflecting off the water to get a double effect if they could find the right place to watch from. At any rate, they had to pass by some dark and desolate places on shore that night before they got to where everyone was gathering to watch the show in the sky. Grandpa said his girlfriend was getting creeped out and told the boys to paddle harder and faster. Then, his friend's girl screamed, and everyone looked on shore to see a kind of creature that none of them could immediately put a word to. In their world at that time, a werewolf meant Michael landed in a school team jacket with fur glued to his face. It was a spooky character from a black and white movie. It wasn't something real. Grandpa usually called it a monster, but when he described it, that sounded like a dogman to me. What he said they were seeing was the size of a very tall football player, but it did not appear to be human. It had a head shaped more like a wolf head, with tall pointed ears on top. They could make out the eye shine, even from the middle of the lake, where they were, and the creature looked angry at them, for whatever reason. I asked what it was wearing, but Grandpa said that this was an animal. It was wearing its birthday suit, he said. It was covered in fur, but not in clothing. By the time he was telling the old story to me many years later, Grandpa did sometimes refer to it as a werewolf, because he said it somewhat resembled the creatures in The Howling, which was a movie we saw together in the theater. And those were werewolves in that film. But when this originally happened to him, The Howling was still decades away, so he and his friends didn't and couldn't make that reference. To them, that was a monster on the shore of Keystone Lake, and it was pacing their boat as they rowed, staring at them intently. Grandpa's friend insisted that it was staring at the girls, which only made the two of them panic. And when the beast man walked out closer to the shore to get a better look, the girls started screaming for help. There were less people around there than usual, since everyone was heading to the same place they were. Nobody heard their screaming. Except for the dog man, that is. He heard it, and it seemed to hurt his ears. So he made this sound sort of like a deep-voiced dog howl to express his displeasure. But the girl screamed even louder, and the dog man flew into a canine rage. It ran toward the shore running out into the water on its hind legs, then diving forward and swimming like a young Mark Spitz, straight for Grandpa's boat. I remember once making a kid's joke about it doing the doggy paddle, and Grandpa paused to make certain that I understood. He was not joking around with this story. This was an animal in the woods of Pennsylvania, which had a body similar enough to a human that it could literally swim like we do. At first, the boys tried paddling even harder to try to get away from that thing, but it was able to swim faster than they could propel the rowboat, and it soon caught up. The girls scrambled to the far end of the little wooden boat, with the boys taking turns trying to whack the dogman with their oars, mostly very unsuccessfully. It took too long to pull the oar back and take another shot, and the dogman was able to simply dive underwater, to prevent being hit hard by either one of them. The boys were getting tired, but the manic dogman seemed to only be getting started. Grandpa said that the creature would fight with its mouth and teeth, 
the way many canines do, but that it also had what he called bear claws with thumbs. I took that to mean, I took that to mean it had hand-like paws with claws, as he said it would sometimes try to grab the paddles away from them, using both its jaws and its claws. That seemed to imply that it could hold things with those paws. In fact, I'm certain that's what he meant by that term, bear claws with thumbs. One of the aspects of the encounter which really shook my grandpa up was the way that the creature's eyes seemed lit from within. He said at first it seemed to be eyeshine, but when they were battling at close range in the boat, the eyes continued to maintain that bright glow, which made no sense in that context. The creature was lit as well as they were in that instance, so why did its eyes still appear so bright? I can't answer that question, and I know it unnerved Grandpa until the day he died. The creature got one human-like arm over one side of the craft, and momentarily lifted its horrific head out of the water for all four of them to see. Grandpa said it looked as though the thing had a dark red, almost black skin under that fur that might have been brown when it was dry, but it looked black in that dark boat on that hot night. He told me that he hadn't believed his friend earlier when he had been ranting about how the creature wanted the women, but when the beast had its head out of the water, something happened to change his mind. According to my grandfather, the dogman's eyes looked over his friend, then him, then his friend's girlfriend, and then when those eyes finally came to rest on Grandpa's girlfriend, they grew wide, and his mouth widened too. Then its tongue fell out of its mouth, and all I can assume is that it was drooling over that woman that almost became my grandmother. Now in what sense he was drooling over her is a question left open to history, because Grandpa says he got mad and whacked the monster right on the noggin, causing it to slip back into the water and have to start over in its attempts to get into the boat. Just then, the fireworks show started, with bright lights flashing in the sky, and huge deep booming sounds echoing all around the area. The dogman's eyes widened at this human witchcraft, and he dove under the water, swimming away to some place that none of the four of them could see. The attack from the dogman was over, but none of them knew for how long. The boys returned to paddling, and the four of them enjoyed the fireworks show as well as they could. While there, they ran into a couple in another rowboat that they recognized, and who also happened to be returning in the same direction after the show was over. They agreed to paddle back alongside Grandpa's boat, since they said they had felt strangely nervous on the way over there that night. They said they felt like they were being watched, and Grandpa's crew just nodded silently. No need to share their story in that moment. It might only make the trip back that much harder. Well, that dogman had beat it for parts unknown, and they weren't bothered by him on the return voyage. They went back to the area on vacation days for years afterward, and they never saw the beast man again. Grandpa's opinion was that he didn't think it usually came around that lake, and it was most likely just a fluke encounter that won't ever repeat. But he did believe that if you walk out into those woods beyond where humans like to vacation in Pennsylvania, well then, then you are likely to come across not only Dogman, but Bigfoot, and some mysteries even stranger than those two. Grandpa told me that the woods are a different world from the town, and that I should always remember and respect that about it. I don't think I really fully got what he was saying when I was young, but his words still echo in my mind and heart to this day, and I'm grateful he shared his July 4th encounter with me. I hope you enjoyed it, and happy Independence Day. We'd like to thank Mr. John Carnegie. From right here to Copenhagen. Please join us in welcoming back John Carnegie to our channel memberships. John gets to see our secret, uncensored, scary dogman stories, and so can you. If you listen to our international TV spokesmongrel, Henry Lee Dogman. Thank you. Thanks, Biggie.
and thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button. Or join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804-LA-SCARY. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after I think three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back for more scary stories.